I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times, and welcome to The New York Times Close Up. This week, we we'll talk about a recent Rikers lawsuit that underscores the long history of issues within our city jails and the subsequent financial burden they represent that are driving reform. But first, Monday marks the beginning of Donald Trump's 34 felony count criminal trial in New York. It could be the only case against the former president to be tried before November's election. In this week's New York Times Magazine, Times investigative journalist Kim Barker takes an in-depth look at the man prosecuting the case, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. She does that story with Jonah Bromwich and Michael Rothfeld. And Kim, thank you for joining us. When this case first came out, when it was first announced by Alvin Bragg, it looked a little bit like the lesser of the cases facing Donald Trump. Uh, secret documents that he took out of the White House interfering with the election in uh, 2020. How does it look now compared to those cases, particularly since, as we said, it's the only one that may actually come to trial before the election? When Alvin Bragg announced these charges, it was about a year ago, and it was before any of the other criminal charges had been filed, though they were sort of like lurking in the background, right? When it came out, he was pretty much roundly pilloried for, is this a case? Is this really the case that you want to be bringing? Because there had been a huge kerfuffle in the DA's office about that, about which case he was going to take on. And whether any case... And whether any case was going to move forward. So when this came out, I think that there was a sense of, in some quarters, like, OK, we're glad that the president has been charged, because certainly Manhattan is very democratic, um, you know, borough in New York. But there was a sense also, is this the case that we want to be bringing against Donald Trump? Is this the best case that Manhattan can bring? What about these other cases that are pending? And he also got criticized for his legal theory that he was using to justify charging these counts as felonies, right? So in the very beginning, it was sort of like these legal professors and law folks saying, you know, this case is probably never going to stand. Bad idea, Alvin Bragg. And it was another sort of wrist slapping that he got after just taking over the year before as district attorney. But as the year has gone on, there have been three other criminal charges filed. Uh, three other criminal cases filed, I should say, two federal and one out of Georgia. And they have been very successfully sort of stalled by Trump's team, which is a very famous Trump legal tactic. Let's just stall, delay, like push this past the presidential election. This is the one case that has stood. And it's also a case that has been deemed like this is this case is good enough to go forward by a federal judge and by the the judge, the state judge that is actually taking the case on in Manhattan. And it looks good at this point, according to the legal folks we talked to. They've justified they've said that, like, this is a good case to move forward. And it seems to be the only case that's going to be definitely heard before the election. So it looks it looks like. This is the case that was considered to be the runt of the litter in the very beginning. And now it's the case that's considered to be more of an election interference case. Sure, it's about a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election that was then repaid. But you can justify it, and he has done this recently, as being an election interference case. Explain the, to yeah. me, explain to me sure. why this is not a misdemeanor case for lousy record keeping. Right, because that was the argument in the very beginning. This Maybe this should be misdemeanors, 34 business records, because the charges essentially are falsifying business records, right? Um, that these like, checks and receipts and these 34 examples that they have were basically falsified and said to be legal payments rather than being like, this is a payment, to, this is a hush money payment mm -hmm. to, to a former porn star to basically silence her from talking about the sex that she claims to have had with Trump 10 years earlier, right? That's what the case is. So uh, uh, normally these would be considered to be misdemeanors, right? Falsifying business records, unless they were committed in furtherance or to hide or conceal another crime, right? That's what can elevate it up to a felony mm -hmm. if, if, if they can prove that. 
The unusual thing about this particular case and these th 34 counts is that they were elevated to felonies without actually specifying what that felon, that, what that other crime was. No, the are they going to specify that in the course they of the have, trial? They have since sort of said, and like Alvin Bragg has said, like, you know, it could be federal election crime, that he was committing a federal election crime here. He was interfering in election. It could be tax crimes. Um, but they haven't charged that other crime, which is unusual. But both a federal judge has said it's okay to go ahead, and, a, and a, the state judge that's hearing the case has said it's okay to move ahead. So what would the federal crime be? And if I'm on a jury hearing this case, don't I need to know what other crime he committed that would justify the felony charge? I mean, I, I think that that's something they're going to get into in the trial, but the judge has said it's okay. So it's more going to be something for the, for an appeal that Trump might be able to, you know, his lawyers might be able to do if, if indeed he is convicted on these charges. So is it really about falsifying business uh, records or is it corrupting a presidential election? Well, the charges are falsifying business records, felony counts of that, right? But the underlying, what they're saying is that these this was done to actually, like, hide the fact that he was he had he had paid this woman off before the election so it could be election interference right federal campaign laws um, but it's not actually been charged now why did Bragg pursue this case and not the other cases that uh, could have been pursued by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and other people suggested that uh, might be stronger. He pursued this case because it had a clean narrative and a story that was easy to tell. This is at least what we've been told, mm -hmm. right? Hush money. People understand what that is. And in fact, hush, paying hush money isn't a crime in New York State, right? So, but it's, this is something that was done to cover up a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels. It's a very clean, simple narrative, right? You've got Donald Trump himself signing nine of the checks that were part of the repayment, right? You've got, a, a, you've got this guy who can be a tour guide, Michael Cohen, who is actually in the room and can walk people through what happened. Is he a credible witness? I mean, that's the, guy's the argument. A liar. That's the argument. He's not just a liar, he's a convicted liar, mm. right? So, I mean, that's what Bragg is going to have to, he's going to have to get over that threshold that his, one of his key witnesses, and you could argue it's his star witness, is somebody who's, you know, pretty complicated and he's got his own complicated legal record. But I think the argument that they, they can make and that they're probably going to make is that he was doing a lot of that lying and committing most of those crimes in furtherance of helping Donald Trump. Right. You, you point out that when uh, Alvin Bragg announced these charges, he never mentioned hush money, never mentioned sex. What does right. that say about him? I think that it says that he's a pretty sober lawyer who looks at details and he's detail oriented and he's not getting into that sort of the salacious side of things. I also think it shows the fact that he's not really your typical politician, right? He's not somebody who got up there in the very beginning and called this an election interference case. He's somebody who got up there and said, this is falsifying business records, and that's a very important thing. Um, so it's, it's different than the sort of politician DAs that, you know, we've had in the past and that other, you know, other communities still have. What is the defense going to say in response to these charges, do you think? It's hard to get in their head. They can't say th certain things. They can't argue things like selective prosecution. The d judge has thrown that out. It might be part of, like, an appeal. But I think that they're going to try to say that Trump did not intend this to interfere with the election, that Trump was trying to protect Melania, that th there was no intent here. That, and that also this Protect not, her from embarrassment. Yeah, from embarrassment, mm -hmm. right? You know, because um, that's, you know, what he's alluded to in the past. He's denied having, he's denied do, paying hush money. He's de denied having sex with her. But he said, I didn't want this to come out. Um, and so, therefore, like, I paid this off. And I think that could be their argument, that there was no intent here to commit business fraud in furtherance of another crime, right? Therefore, you know, maybe these could be misdemeanors, but they're certainly not felonies, and that the president is not guilty of this. And if they were misdemeanors, what would a penalty be? If they were misdemeanors, I mean, it's going to be under a year, right? Because But he could be sentenced to jail, theoretically.
I mean, sure, but that's very theoretically. If these are felonies, he gets like the maximum he could get is four years in, in prison, right? But I think everybody agrees here that like the real, the real implications of this are more for the election than there are for like Donald Trump going away behind bars before the election. And how... That's, in, that's not going to happen. In here. terms of the trial itself, how is that going to interfere with his campaigning, do you think? Or is How it long will campaign? the trial take? Or is it his campaign, right? right? Can you yes. use that as a stump, a place to stump and say, this is unfair, I'm being unfairly targeted here, right? right? And persecuted. And persecuted, even. What we were told in the beginning, what we learned in, in February, is that they expected jury selection to take one to two weeks, right? It could take even longer, though, because it, it feels like getting a jury here is, is the really important part of the case, mm -hmm. right? And then they expect the case itself, maybe four or five weeks, you know, the actual arguments. So you're, we're talking about like May before you're actually going to hear arguments in the case. Two things in this magazine piece in the Times that you said that I found particularly interesting. One. Only two. Oh, at least two. <laughs> uh, impossible to find anyone who worked with Alvin Bragg who has a negative thing to say about him. And also in spite of his so-called day one announcement about crimes he wasn't going to prosecute, he has not, by most definitions, been soft on crime since he took office as the first black Manhattan district attorney. Elaborate on those two things, if you could, a little bit. Okay, let's start with the fact that it's impossible to find anybody who's worked with him who will say something negative. It is very unusual, and you know this, Sam, as a journalist, when you're profiling anybody not to find somebody who's at lukewarm. Like, you, you might find people say positive things in some lukewarm things. You might find somebody who says, like, you know, uh, on background, or I'll tell you th this, but only if we go off the record, and then they want to say negative right. things about the That's person. That's unusual. And the record... This is, this, is, this is somebody who anybody you call, like, even people who you're not told he was friends, you just sort of randomly call somebody right. who would have worked with them just positive things to say. I always sort of, like, thought of... Alvin Bragg, like, the, you know, one of the contestants on the game show or the reality show Survivor, mm. who is completely underestimated in the very beginning and who goes along and makes alliances and watches everything. And survives. And survives. And very quickly, the substantive record. This, uh, the, 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 can you repeat that question again? The, uh, that he's not soft on crime right, or hasn't right, been. Right, right, right. I mean, like, that was the whole rap he got coming in after his campa campaign and being looked at as a progressive candidate for, for prosecutor. And certainly compared to the prosecutors we've had in the past, yes, he's more progressive. But he's not all the way on the other side of things. He's a very middle-of-the-road compromiser who anytime he talks about the times that he was pulled over and, and by the police when he was a youth in Harlem, he's talking about the fact that like he was also pulled over, he was also had guns pointed at him by criminals. Anytime he criticizes the police, he comes back and he credits the police for keeping the community safe. And I think he's really tried to thread that needle since taking over. Um, he had some hiccups in the very beginning because of the day one memo, though. And the statistics seem to bear yeah. that out. Yeah, for sure. Kim Barker, The New York Times, her story in this week's New York Times magazine. And coming up next, the urgent need for reform and accountability in the city's jails. <music> the city of New York recently settled for $28.7 million, a lawsuit brought by the family of Nicholas Feliciano, a mentally ill 18-year-old Rikers Island inmate who suffered severe brain damage from a suicide attempt carried out while guards looked on. Since the settlement, we've also learned about several Rikers Island employees who were charged with accepting bribes and smuggling drugs for inmates. New York Times Metro journalist Jan Ransom has been covering problems at Rikers, which is slated to be closed in 2027. Jan, how does a, a court, how does a judge, how does a jury come up with $28 million as what someone's life is worth for going through this experience? Yeah, so in this case, uh, this is actually a pre-trial settlement. Um, so it was agreed upon between the lawyers and the city of New York. Um, and, you know, they often assess, you know, what would a person have earned throughout the period of their lifetime? 
Um, and they also account for the care that they'll need. And so in this case, um, you know, Nicholas Feliciano, um, as you stated, you know, he suffered severe brain damage and he'll need a lifetime of care. He needs assistance walking, eating. Um, he has trouble remembering um, things from day to day. And so he needs a lot of hands-on care. Whatever we think of what he was or wasn't guilty of, he was in Rikers at that point for what, a parole violation? Correct. He was there for a parole violation. Um, and many of the detainees on Rikers, uh, actually most of them, are there pretrial. So they have not been convicted of any crime. And when he got to Rikers, people knew that he was mentally ill, possibly suicidal? Yeah, he had a very long, extensive history. Uh, he had been on Rikers before uh, when he was uh, 16, I believe. And he had also been at the city's juvenile center. And they had a very long record of his uh, suicide attempts. Uh, he even had uh, psychiatric hospitalizations while uh, detained uh, before this uh, current incident. Um, and so they knew very well that uh, he needed mental health care and support. Jan, what, what was he convicted of? Was he dangerous? Uh, what was his record? Yeah, so he was not convicted. So he was in on a parole violation at the time. And so this was for a previous charge. Um, I'm not remembering the exact charge at the moment, but um, it was for a previous charge. And so there is a process for parole, um, people who are there on, on parole violations. And so he had not gone through that process yet. He was still very early on Rikers. So when he comes to Rikers and clearly he has a record of, you know, mental problems, possible suicide. What happens to him? As you pointed out in earlier stories, uh, according to the Independent Budget Office and other surveys, something like one-fifth of the inmates on Rikers Island have some sort of mental disability. So what happens when he shows up on Rikers? Yeah, so when he uh, comes to Rikers, he's assessed, and he's assessed to be at zero uh, risk of suicide, um, which is obviously very bizarre given uh, the documented history of uh, suicide. Um, and so from that point, he's placed in uh, various different housing areas, including one that's ripe for gang violence. And he, you know, gets into an altercation with other detainees. And from there, He's isolated in what we know as an intake cell, and that's where he's waiting transportation for medical attention because he was um, pretty badly injured in that fight. And he waits there for six hours, and we can see on the video that the Times obtained that he becomes frustrated and restless. Um, he throws a plate of food at some officers and a captain, and um, things kind of escalate and ramp up from that point. And, you know, we can see in the cell, he already has like a sweater hanging from a hook that no one, none of the officers sort of intervene even at that point to take it down or to assess his mental uh, condition at that point. Um, and from there, he goes on to um, hang himself using these sweaters that he attached to the ceiling. And, you know, we can see just officers walking past him, looking into the cell and, and not really stepping in to help him. We're going to take a look at some of that video while we're talking to Jan Ransom. I will warn our viewers that it is disturbing to watch that video obtained by the New York Times, and you can see it on nytimes.com. Explain to me how guards could be standing around watching this, seeing this for whatever period of time we're talking about, and it wasn't a short period of time, and do nothing. I, I don't get it. Yeah, no, I, I wish I could explain it. Um, I think that's what a lot of people are grappling with and seeing the footage, right? I mean, it's one thing to read about it, but to actually see it in action, it's pretty disturbing. Um, but this goes on for seven minutes and 51 seconds, and we have eight different correction officers and a captain who obviously is in a supervisory role, um, you know, see him from beginning to end. Um, again, like just going back to before he's ever hanging, just the fact that he has these sweaters hanging in the cell, that is someone who is at risk of a suicide. And that was a time 
for them to step in and intervene and that did not happen. And so once he actually hangs, you know, we see him struggling to get back up after immediately after he jumps off the partition. Um, and the officers still don't do anything. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's very disturbing to watch. And what happened to the officers who were involved in this, who just stood by? Mm -hmm. um, several of the officers were suspended for 30 days. Um, four uh, of the officers, including the captain, um, were charged criminally. Um, two officers pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor and avoided jail time, including an officer who is seen in the video open, opening the cell door while Nicholas is hanging and looking at him, closing it, and then walking away. Um, and so the remaining charges uh, are for the captain and one other officer who are awaiting trial. Um, another officer um, resigned. A couple of others are still working there and were never suspended or anything. Um, and the captain is still working there as well, um, despite, you know, his history of uh, poor supervision of detainees. Jen, what is the source of the video? And would anything have happened uh, in terms of disciplinary action had it not been for the video? That's a great question. So the video is, uh, you know, from the New York City Department of Correction, um, but we obtained it from the lawyers representing Nicholas Feliciano. Um, and, you know, oftentimes there is a question of like believability when something like this happens. And so I think the video definitely helped. Um, but, you know, I guess when you look at what has happened to the officers in terms of um, consequences uh, compared to what we actually see, I think a lot of people are struggling to uh, reconcile the two. Uh, the Department of Correction says that it has taken steps to reduce self-harm, as they put it, to inmates. The Board of Correction, which is an oversight agency, says, no, things are actually getting worse. Who's right? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I, the Board of Correction um, is not wrong. Um, you know, we've seen with the people who have died on Rikers that many of them, you know, have suffered from mental illness, and this has happened in the throes of uh, suicide attempts um, in some instances, and officers kind of just did not intervene or did not intervene fast enough. Um, and there was a pretty um, gruesome case uh, years after Nicholas Feliciano involving a detainee who actually used uh, an institutional razor that he'd been given to slit his throat and the officers did not provide aid to him um, as he was bleeding out in his cell. And so this is something that we've seen time and time again. Um, on the other hand, uh, the Department of Correction has said that officers do receive mental health training. Um, so I suppose it's a question of, you know, if they're retaining the training or, or what, um, but, you know, we do see instances where the officers do not intervene when someone is clearly in mental health distress. Jen, maybe this is a rhetorical question, forgive me, but if we can't keep weapons and drugs from being smuggled into Rikers Island, how are we gonna keep them off the subways? Right, right, and and I don't know the, the answer to that. I suppose you can't, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question indeed. And let me ask another question because it's something I really don't quite understand. Rikers is supposed to close in 2027. It may or may not meet that deadline. What is that going to accomplish? There's still going to be detainees in detention facilities around the city. Why is that going to be better than it will be, than it has been at Rikers? Yeah, so the idea has been to make jails that are more humane and more accessible to like families and friends who want to visit detainees because right now you know to get onto rikers you have to take a bus and then once you're there you have to take additional transportation to the individual facilities where your loved one may be and so it's just a very long process that is often an all-day event um and so the idea was that that would change if you know a loved one can go visit their their friend or family in the borough that they live in. Um, and also Rikers is, you know, falling apart in a lot of ways. Um, 
cell doors don't work. Um, oftentimes the weapons that are on Rikers are used from pieces of plexiglass or other parts of structures that are falling apart. And so um, there is a real need to get off the island, uh, but it's very unlikely to happen by 2027 uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, the mayor, Mayor Eric Adams has um, pretty much been uh, open about not supporting the idea anymore, even though at the beginning of the administration, he was in support of it. Um, and also the population on Rikers is not what it was, I'd say like during the height of COVID when the city was able to get it down to about 3000 detainees. Um, the borough based jail plan allows for 3,300. Right now, the population is 6,200. And so it's just not going to work. Thanks to Jen Ransom of the New York Times for that very revealing report. And coming up next, my thoughts on an election that maybe didn't count. Maybe you missed it, but New York held its presidential primaries last month. No spoiler alert necessary. Biden and Trump won. About 19 in 20 eligible Democrats and Republicans didn't bother to vote. That doesn't bode well for November. It's true that New York's clout in presidential campaigns has been declining. In every census from 1950 through 2010, the state lost at least two electoral votes. Since then, both Texas and Florida outranked New York. Not since Ronald Reagan won in 1980 and 1984 has a Republican presidential candidate carried New York State. The last time New York voters sided with a losing Republican was in 1948, when Tom Dewey, the incumbent governor, beat Harry Truman, in New York, that is. This year, some Democrats protested President Biden's Middle East policy by leaving their choice blank. For what it's worth, we don't know yet how many. Protest votes are, of course, a democratic tradition, especially when they don't count. In November, though, they could determine the outcome. The candidates come here to raise money from contributors. But even if they take New York voters for granted, shouldn't you make your vote count for something? Remember, twice since 1988, a Republican was elected president, even though the Democrat got more votes nationwide. So what do you do? Protest the Hobson's choice by supporting a third party candidate, which could be considered a wasted vote or worse, not bother to show up at all. Another cop out. Boycott the process and then complain for four years that the greater of two evils wound up winning. Spend your weekends campaigning in the handful of contested states that will determine the outcome. The primary turnout doesn't bode well for civic engagement. To paraphrase Ed Koch after he was defeated for a fourth term as mayor, the people voted against me and they deserved what they got. For The New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.